Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and today we are heading to British Columbia for our continuing series on municipal leaders from across this great country. We are heading to the city of Kelowna, where we are sitting down with two-term councillor and also the chair, and I want to get this right here, the chair of the Regional District of the Central Okanagan, which we'll be talking about later on in the episode. Please help me welcome Councillor Loyal Wooldridge. Councillor, I hopefully pronounced your last name right. I literally Googled it and I tried to figure it out and hopefully I did. But welcome to the show. You did a great job, Chris. Thank you so much. I know my last name is a bit cumbersome. And uh, I am speaking to you today in the city of Kelowna, which is located on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan people. I have done over 500 and as of this airing, 30 interviews. You were the first person to do that just off the bat. So thank you so much for uh, giving the land acknowledgement. Um, but I want to start with the question I've asked every single politician on my show, and you're no exception. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, counselor? So it actually dates way back to grade school. I was always really involved since about, oh, grade six in student council. So I've always been very engaged and passionate about growing community and giving back. And uh, my elections dated back to, uh, yeah, grade grade six, uh, when only the grade sevens were running for student council. So it kind of dates back a little ways. So what made you decide that in 2018, when you were first elected, that you were going to run for politics in 2018, but you were going to do it on the municipal level. What was the decision about getting involved municipally rather than either provincially, school board, or federal? Sure. Okay, that's a great question. And um, back in 2018, first of all, local local politics is something I've always been very interested in because it's closest to the people and they're the services that we interact with the most. Oftentimes, we don't think about municipal politics because we always think prime minister or premier, um, but but the services that we engage with as citizens on a, on a daily basis falls to the local realm. And actually, what really got me excited about uh, local politics in 2018 were the social issues that we're faced with here locally, as well as provincial um, homelessness, poverty, mental health and substance use. And, and the main reason I pulled the trigger in 2018 was my mom unfortunately passed away in 2016. She was only 56. And it was really unexpected. And when that happened, um, it made me realize that time isn't always promised. And while I've always been interested in leadership, I hadn't really made the decision to to jump into it. So when I lost my mom, I realized that if there's something you want to do, you need to you need to do it. So when the election came up in 2018, and I was ignited with the passion around social challenges, uh, that's when I threw my my hat into the ring. And there was only one um, counselor at the time that wasn't running again. And I was fortunate enough to um, to secure that seat back then. Was there an issue for the city of Kelowna that was pressing or you talk about the social issues that you were uh, passionate about, whether it be uh, houselessness or uh, sorry, I wrote down two other ones, but my pen died out. But what what was it about what was going on in Kelowna at the time that you decided, OK, I'm the best person because you could have gone out and got someone else to run, but you decided, OK, after my mom's uh, untimely passing, uh, if you, you're passionate about it, you got to do it. What else sparked that interest to say, okay, if not now, when, if not who, uh, me, then who? So what was it about your passion for addressing these social issues that you said, okay, it has to be me? So um, I come from a business background, actually the hairdressing industry. And so I opened my business when I was 21. And a couple of years before I ran for council, I moved my business to the downtown core of Kelowna. And so every single day, I was starting to see the challenges that we were faced with as a city. And when I built my business, it was built on the pillar of community and always giving back. So I was deeply engaged with nonprofits and non-government organizations in town. And in those conversations with folks, whether it was the women's show, or the John Howard Society, I just saw this need. And because of my background in business, but also my social heart of understanding the challenges and, and why they came to be, is why I felt I was qualified to step into that fray. Now, of course, um, 
those issues are provincial in nature. And so that's been the challenge navigating over the past four and a half years is becoming a, a, an advocate for our community when we don't necessarily have the mandate or the funding to address the issues. And, and we've made headway with the province, um, but that was that was why I stepped forward on the social side. We're going to talk about some of the issues that are facing Kelowna a little bit later on in the interview, but I want to go back to that very first election, because as someone who has ran for municipal politics, I I remember being on the ballot. I remember going in and seeing my name on the ballot. I remember putting up signs. I remember door knocking, and I thought I had a uh, a pulse on what my community's wants and needs were. When you were out door knocking that very first election in 2018, were there issues that were coming up that you went, Oh, I didn't expect this to be an issue, but I'm glad someone's talking about it. So that way, if if I am lucky enough to be selected and chosen as the next councillor for the city of Kelowna, I'm able to address those as well as the issues that I believe need to be addressed. So where I began when I started researching this a year in advance of the election was looking at our citizen survey that's done every two years in the city of Kelowna over a broad range of of folks. Um, And that gave me a view around where people were feeling um, challenged or whether they felt things were going well in the city. And that prepared me to do my door knocking and and get out in the community. So I have to say that I wasn't overly surprised by a lot of the challenges or issues that people were bringing forward. Obviously, there's nuanced ones from neighborhood to neighborhood or individual to individual. But I have to say, in doing the preparation work a year in advance and sitting in council chambers for every single meeting for a year before I ran, it gave me a really good picture of an impulse of where the community was at. And then, of course, door knocking creates that level of engagement one on one with folks. And it just kind of reaffirms um, a lot of that data and, um, and the learning that I had in advance. The educational part of that is were there more macro issues that were involved in the city of Kelowna during that election or were there more micro local targeted issues like my pothole needs to be fixed, my park needs to be upgraded? Were there more micro issues or were they more, okay, we need to address homelessness, we need to address health care? What, what was the balance did you find? So I think it always starts macro. And then once you start going into your door knocking neighborhood to neighborhood or person to person is where you start to to drill down into those more micro issues for a community. So you might find one area like Glenmore is really passionate about recreation facilities that they don't feel has been addressed. Or you're downtown and you're talking more about homelessness or you're more in an agricultural area and there's challenges around potholes. So once you start to drill down, um, those are where the micro issues would come about. But I would have to say that the macro are really what guide the city and most people were talking about. So that's, you know, transportation, housing, um, and those big files. You you educated yourself prior to putting your name on the ballot. Do you think that made you a better candidate at in the long run? Because you knew, you educated, you looked at that community survey, you understood sort of what was going on in the community? Because some people just put their name on the ballot. And I'm not trying to div, uh, divert the conversation here. It's just an interesting topic that you said, because not a lot of people will research the job that they're about to get into before they get into it. And you took the time and you educated yourself with the resources that the city provided almost everyone. Well, if, if you fail, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And that's always been a motto of mine throughout life. And I always share with people when they're thinking about running. First, my question is always, why do you want to run? And secondly, have you sat in on council meetings and seen what we actually do? And, and I think that's really important, aside from the information, but to fully understand the scope of your role as an elected official, because a lot of people get involved with local politics thinking you're going to get super operational and pull all these levers and start choosing what, what you know, chemical is sprayed down to melt ice. And while some some communities that may be so, I believe high level governance means that you need to kind of come out of the weeds and come to 30,000 feet and start guiding the city from a policy perspective. So it's just really important for folks to know that when they put the name on the ballot, what the job is, and then, of course, drill down into to some of the content that guides the city. And that just sets you up better to, to sit in the chair. And I always um, felt more firm when people said, oh, you sound like you're speaking like an incumbent. And that reaffirmed to me like, OK, I've, I've got some some of this information. Of course, um, some people don't think an incumbent should be reelected and there should be new faces all the time. But I think when you're when you're prepared going in, it just gives you a stronger base 
so you can start making decisions right away without having to do a, a ton of orientation right when you're elected. So I want to talk about election night in 2018, the very first time you were elected. Um, take me through that night. What was that moment like when the announcement came across that while the majority of your council has been reelected, you were the only new face on that said on the city of Kelowna's council that was going in not as an incumbent? What was that moment like for you? I have to say it was one of the most fulfilling moments in my life because um, we were fighting really hard for six months leading up to it. And of course you have all the, all the emotions, the roller coaster that you go through when you're, when you get a really tough door or a debate doesn't go exactly how you feel. And then you're sitting at home with your, with your team wa watching the results come in and obviously you fall behind sometimes and you skip ahead in others. And so it was just reaffirming to me that I saw the confidence in, in the community and, and specifically to the results, it was really looking at the polling station to see that we had a fairly equal result throughout the city, which is really what we were going for. Um, because again, we really wanted to saturate all areas of the community to understand where Kelowna was at and not just spike in certain neighborhoods that I may live in. Um, so it was fulfilling and um, rewarding and also reaffirming. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but the city of uh, Kelowna is elected, the councillors are elected at a at-large basis. They're not as a ward district, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. we're an at-large council. Okay. So I want to turn to that moment of, okay, the, 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 the reality is set in. You're now officially an elected official. You're councillor-elect Wooldridge. When does that that high of getting elected turn to... Now the real work begins. Now the moment that I wasn't really prepared for, because you're never really prepared for going in and making decisions. While you can be educated, you have to make the decision. How long does it take you to go from, yes, I've got elected to, oh no, the responsibility that I make the decisions are going to have to be correct because I'm going to be affecting people's pocketbooks. I'm going to be affecting people's livelihoods and I'm going to be affecting people's businesses. When does that set in for you? So I, I never really had an oh no moment. I was more like, let's get to work. <laughs> Um, and, and the mayor at the time said, well, we've got four years, calm down. Um, but it, it was more about, you know, let's get to work. This is exciting. So I never really had an oh no moment. Um, probably my biggest um, kind of trepidation, if you will, would be making sure that I was well informed in those decisions that I was making, ensuring that I had the background information and I did my research to make an informed decision. Because as members of the public, we often get engaged with matters that affect us most or might be in our neighborhoods um, or we have an unconscious bias about. And so for me, it was really kind of removing my own bias and voting for things that were for the best of the community. And sometimes you would have to vote for things that might not benefit your neighborhood, but would benefit others. So for me, it was just having the ability to drill down into that information to make, make it in an informed way. So you bring up a good point. While you need to be informed, while you need to be educated on issues, as elected officials, you need to go into the council chambers also with an open mind. Because you have people, residents, who will give public hearings on certain issues. You will hear arguments from your fellow councillors, and they may have an idea or a viewpoint that you might not have thought. While it's important to be educated, how important is it for yourself to have that open mind going into decisions? Or are you one of these open and shut, once I've made the decision, it's locked in and nothing can change it? Well, first and foremost, uh, we all should be going into every decision with an open mind because that's where the information is publicly available. So for me, it's always going in with an open mind. Again, sometimes I'll read a report and go, oh, really? Is this what's coming forward? Or I don't really understand the direction that we're going with this or why we got here. Um, but, but it's crucial because you have to be able to change based on new information or what your colleagues are sharing. Again, when you um, might not necessarily be engaged with a subject matter like agriculture, for example, um, or water systems, you have to go in thinking, okay, how, how am I going to make the best decision based on the information I have today. What was the biggest eye-opening experience or the edu most educational part of the job process from when you got elected to now? Was there a moment when you went, I didn't expect the job to be this, but 
I I've had to uh, educate myself, but also grow accustomed to the way that municipal politics works. Uh, I think coming from the private sector, it's learning how government works and how <laughs> slow it can be. <laughs> because in business, you know, it's your own business. You can make a decision to change on a dime or, you know, fire someone or bring on a new contract. Um, but very different in the public realm. There's RFP processes and transparency that have to be considered. So for me, it was the slowness, frankly, in which government operates, and then um, ensuring that those trans transparency pieces are there so that you're you're following the guidelines. So it was more around time. And again, I, I get quite impatient because I see uh, a problem and I come up with a solution and would want to see it implemented. So it's probably the time in which it takes to get things done in government that was my biggest eye opener. You, you said the key word there, and I want to jump on that, and that's the public and private I issues. Um, your job, while it is, I'm assuming, it's not a full-time counselor's position, unlike a MPP or MLA or MP, um, you're on 24-7. You are counselor if you go grocery shopping, if you're working, you are a counselor. How do you balance that lifestyle? Because I can imagine there's days when you just want to be loyal. You just want to be average, old, loyal. But if you go to the grocery store, you can't be that. You're always counselor. How have you been able to find the balance after five years in office to do both and not be so stressed about it? Because I think a lot of people don't get into municipal politics because they're afraid of that aspect of the job. So I think probably the hardest part of that is on family because you uh, you go out for dinner on a Friday date night and you're you're seated in a dining room and someone's coming up to talk to you about X, Y, and Z or, or a matter in their neighborhood. So that's probably the hardest thing that I still work on balancing is with family time and private time that... Yes, I'll absolutely meet with you. Uh, reach out to me through my my official channels and we can schedule a meeting. But right now it's family time and it's Friday night. And I would just like to enjoy my martini, please. Um, so Are people willing me, to accept that? Are people willing to accept that in Kelowna? Yeah, yeah, they absolutely are. Again, it's uh, it's the boundary piece, and I'm a people pleaser, so boundaries are are difficult for me. And I also love my job, so I could do it twenty four seven. Um, but I realize that on family, they they my partner needs uh, one on one time with me, and um, that's where the boundaries have to come in. Because I would work twenty, like I said, I would work twenty four seven. I love this gig, um, and then I, I I probably would say that I've become a little bit more introverted as my terms have gone on, enjoying more like outdoor time away from folks or or a lot more traveling when I have time off because again when you're in your city you're always on and you're always running into to residents that have um that have concerns abuse against municipal officials elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years and to date everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own and often on a case-by-case -case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. I want to turn to segment two now, and this is the big segment because I want to talk about the city of Kelowna, but also I want to talk about the regional district of central Okanagan. And before I start this segment, because we always, no matter who it is, we always get emails. I want to preface this question by saying this, this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion at council. This is not a direction at council. This is his opinion and talking to the host of the cross-border interviews. So, Counselor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Kelowna today? And then I'm going to ask you that exact same question when it comes to the regional district of the Central Okanagan. So, in your opinion, 
what's the biggest issue facing the city of Kelowna? I would say um, the income gap and and um, affordability of living, and that flows into a whole b- bunch of different subjects. That would probably be our biggest challenge right now in Kelowna. So I'm going to ask the million dollar question that I think uh, you were probably going to be prepared for, but how are you as a council and as a councillor helping to try to address this issue for your residents today? So I'm very passionate about giving a voice to underrepresented voices. And I think when we look at uh, poverty gaps or socioeconomic determinants of health, uh, which is directly impacted by affordability, we have to look to marginalized groups and folks that may not necessarily have a voice to vocalize uh, their challenges, be it uh, single parents, the BIPOC community, or the queer community. And so for me, it's really... um, really getting up and close to those to those populations to understand what they need, whether it's education, whether it's transportation, whether it's housing. And I, I really believe that when we take care of our most vulnerable, that's where our community is supported the most. So that's where I spend a lot of my time is focusing on our more vulnerable or marginalized populations in order to address those challenges. Um, of course, I think everyone in Canada is talking about housing right now, and, and Kelowna is no exception. We've seen an exponential amount of growth in our, our, um, our regional area. So for me, it's continuing to focus on housing of all sorts, whether it's social or rental or market purchase. So um, it, that's a long-winded answer to your question. But um, again, it's focusing on those underrepresented voices um, to learn from them and find out what they need. You talk about housing, and it's been a, a reoccurring issue that's been coming up a lot in this series that I'm putting together. Um, I, I'm assuming, and I'm gonna, I, I know you should never assume because you're putting in something out of you and me, but Kelowna is not any different than any other city right now when it comes to the nimbyism of the issue about housing, not in my backyard. Yeah. I don't 100%. want it here. I don't want it. I'm assuming you hear about it all the time when you're talking about housing and trying to help people get a leg up. How do you battle back against the nimbyism in your community? And how do you say when we work together as a city and not just individual communities, it does make us a better community together? So I had the privilege over the last four years of working on the um the complete complete rework of our official community plan. It t- it spanned the entirety of our last term, which was probably one of the highest degrees of public engagement that the city of Kelowna has seen in terms of a policy document. And I was really honored to do that because it really touched every area of Kelowna and it's probably one of the most progressive housing plans that the city has seen. And so by developing that and now adopting it, it gives me more confidence to have those conversations with people in public because, again, people don't necessarily care about it until it's in their neighborhood. Um, but when you can show data and you can show a growth strategy around how we're going to be addressing key issues like affordability, it it gives you a little bit more ammo in your toolbox to have those discussions in neighborhoods. It comes up every single public hearing. I'm not opposed to development, just not here. It just should be somewhere else. Um, But again, it's having those conversations with people. And generally, it's people that already have housing that come out in opposition. So my first question is always, do you have a place to live right now? And generally, the answer is yes. And so the challenging part about our job is explaining that the decisions we're making right now are for young people that may not even know they need housing or for folks that will be moving here in the future. So that never makes you popular as a politician, but that's the main function of municipal politics is housing. So um, it, again, it's having those conversations and sometimes we don't see eye to eye um, and that's fine. But again, I go to a policy level and a data level and um, that kind of gives me, it removes the emotion a little bit from the discussion. Okay, you've opened Pandora's box with that statement, so I'm going to play it for a bit, because emotion is high. Emotion is high right now across this country with inflation, with the cost of living, and some people just want their community to say as it is today. They they love the fact that there's growth going on, but they don't want it because it's going to take away from that vibe that they moved into their community. While it's great to come with data, which is always important, how much is how important is it for you to also take into consideration what they're saying? Because at the end of the day, you're right. You have to look out for the best of your community, but you can't forget the people who've elected you at the same time, right? 100%. 
And so on the opposite side, generally when applicants or proponents are coming forward with applications, I always ask them, what did you change when you went through your neighborhood consultation process? And that's a key question because I, I really want to know how good of a neighbor a developer is being. And if they say, oh, no, I changed nothing at all. I just basically informed the neighborhood of what I was doing. That's harder for me to support when we get to chambers. Because generally when, when people are being reasonable and they just say, you know what, I need a little bit more privacy. I don't like how high this building is going or could there be more screening and developers are able to accommodate some of those requests. It just shows that people are working together and being sensitive to changing neighborhoods. Again, it's not lost on me that people are going to be opposed regardless of what's changed. But again, it's that dialogue and the attempt to work together to, to mitigate those challenges and, and hopefully have a little bit more sensitivity to infill. And, and that's the direction Kelowna is moving when with our housing strategy is around infill and densification. And with that, we're going to mature neighborhoods. So that's where you'll get the most amount of pushback. But um, the number one thing that people talk about here, aside from housing affordability, is traffic and congestion. So again, linking back to those um, those priorities that I hear from the community, if we want to if we want to solve some of those issues, we have to grow differently. And when you link back to different priorities that people have, I often find that they will dial back a little bit. Some will still be hostile. It's the environment we're in. But again, through those consultations and those conversations, generally, people will soften a little bit. How how important is it for communications to play a factor in decisions that the city makes, but also you as councillor? Because as a former communications person for a municipality, I know you can communicate to your blue in the mouth, but there's always going to be that one person who says, well, I didn't get it. I didn't know. What, what are you talking about? It was on the radio. I wasn't listening to the radio at 102 in the morning when it, the ad that you were airing. How important is it? for you to have that communication, but also engage with the people who are not in the communication spheres that you're proper, you're communicating with right now. It, it, it's so true. We often get criticized in the city of Kelowna. Oh, your communication department is so big. You have so many people. You're hiring so many bureaucrats to work in communications. And then on the other side, they're saying, well, I didn't hear about this application or I didn't know that was going on. Oh, well, do, do you subscribe to our development applications that get blasted every single day? No. Oh, well, did you, you know, did you see our social media ads? No. Um, so as cliche it is it as it is, you can't communicate enough. And unfortunately, like marketing when it comes to business, it's the first thing that people want to slice and dice uh, and cut the fat out of. Um, but it is one of the most important parts of what we do lo in local government. Um, so I take it on myself personally to run my own social media, um, to be out engaging with folks. Um, again, you can't do it enough and we do our best. Um, but it's, it's one of those challenging things. What I would say is our big focus right now is actually focusing on growing a robust emergency operations communication strategy. Um, because aside from daily communication, one of the challenges that we've seen with climate change is that um, Kelowna is no stranger to it, whether it's floods, heat domes, fires, as everyone knows about. Um, our, our emergency operations center is now starting to run 365 because uh, we have to prepare for all of these emergencies. So when we talk about communications now, it's often speaking about emergency communication as well. So I want to now turn to the regional district of the central Okanagan and your role as chair there. Now, you were the first person to come on the show who has that title of chair in their name. So I don't know, uh, because I'm from Ontario, where a chair of a region is another level of government, and it is another level of government with collects taxes and does uh, what they need to do. So in BC, what is the role of the regional district of the Central Okanagan? Right. So regional districts in British Columbia were established, oh, I want to say in the 70s as a service delivery model for um, either unincorporated areas or smaller municipalities to come together and share the costs of services that don't really have borders. So if you think about solid waste management like garbage removal or air quality or in Kelowna we have the Okanagan Basin Water Board that manages our, um, our water sources. Um, so, you know, decades ago, they created this regional district model to kind of share that burden of cost and have um, a service delivery model. So every single service has a different uh, budget bucket, if you will, and um, everyone participates differently depending on what their individual community needs. 
So um, it, it and the board is is made up of representatives from the elected officials of the partner municipalities, and those are based on a per capita representation. So in the case of the regional district central Okanagan, six of the 13 directors are from the city of Kelowna. So six of nine of us sit on this board, and then the rest are made up of um, neighboring municipalities, uh, West Bank First Nation, and then our electoral areas, which are unincorporated areas um, of the valley. So um, as my role as chair, it's very similar to um, mayoral powers, um, but you more represent a geographical region versus an individual city. So I find it really interesting because we kind of take off our Kelowna hat and put on a regional hat when we're in this office and get to talk about larger issues that face our region, like transportation, for example. So I was going to, so that's the question I was going to ask. So what is the biggest issue facing the regional district of central Okanagan today? So I would say probably the, the biggest region, regional, well, the most important regional function in my mind would be um, emergency response. So the regional district in charge of the um, emergency operations center. Um, second to that would be transportation. So looking at how everyone moves around around the region, the geography in Kelowna can be challenging if you don't own a car. So something that we're looking at is creating a regional transportation service to begin to bridge that gap and work as a, a bigger advocacy body to the province that manages those larger um, transportation modes like the highway, for example. Um, and then solid waste management. So looking at different organic management, possibly waste energy in the future. So those are some of the biggest challenges that we see. And then we'll be enacting a, um, a, a climate action committee as well to start looking holistically around what is going to create the biggest impact for our region. So how do you balance the regional chair position with your role as councillor? Because I can imagine they're conflicting from time to time as well, because you're you're sitting in your council chambers as at the city of Kelowna representing Kelowna. But you're also voting on things that you're like, OK, the region's trying to address this as well. So how do you balance those two jobs in this hyperbolic days at uh, times that we currently live in? <laughs> So I think it it gives really great perspective. Like I'll use yesterday as an example. We had um, the, BC Transit is changing some of the um, some of the fare management policies around transfers and electronic boarding and, and aspects like that. And so they're coming around to municipalities talking about these changes. And um, the conversation was very Kelowna centric. Well, you know, only people only need to transfer one bus in Kelowna if they're going from this area to that area. So it allows us to have a little bit of a broader perspective around the region to say, well, actually, the buses don't just operate in Kelowna. They operate in West Kelowna and Lake Country. And folks that are living in Lake Country and work in downtown Kelowna need to get on three buses. So it, it gives us a little bit of a, a, a different perspective. Uh, probably the most challenging part is when we're at the regional table and we have to look and go, OK, well, Kelowna pays 69 percent of the bill here. Um, so we're going to shoulder a lot of the cost for something that's probably going to benefit more of the region than it's going to benefit the city of Kelowna. So sometimes we have to make those trade-offs, but I think at the end of the day, it makes uh, communities stronger when we are working together from a regional perspective. So you, you, you've opened uh, a good line of questioning here, and that is the role of the councillor is to move the city forward, but you, you just mentioned it there. The tax base doesn't care about that. They care about their community. They care about their section. Whether you're living in Northeast Kelowna or Southeast Kelowna and Southwest Kelowna, they want what's best for them. How do you, as counselor, at the end of the day, pick the winners and losers? And I say that with respect, and I want to preface this by saying, because if I go talk to 100 people in your community, they will all have 100 different issues, whether it goes to those micro issues of potholes, parks, transportation, healthcare. But you as a councillor and as a chair will have to take a budget and then say, we have to divide this into the best for the community. And that means sometimes people are going to be left behind, not completely left behind, just left behind in the fact that their issue is not going to be addressed this budget cycle. So how do you balance that aspect out of trying to figure out the best for the community while also, again, not forgetting the people? 
So I think that's a really great question because I really think of our city and our region as an ecosystem. So it's not just that there's winners and losers, but everyone has their time. And I'll use the example of um, septic tank removal. So we've been going through a big initiative right now to start removing um, septic systems through different nodes of the city, because obviously it's better for our water systems, it's better for the end user. Um, but the grant programs are specific to certain neighborhoods because obviously you want to be um, transitioning as many people at once. And the most efficient way to do that is, is choosing one area. So that's where we have to really lean into the expert opinions of staff to say, you know, what makes the most sense. Some of those decisions aren't popular and I'll use parks as an example. I live in an area of town called Glenmore and um, there's an area or a, a park called Glenmore Rec Park and it's sat as a weed field for a, a not cannabis, but you know, noxious weeds for a long time. And uh, in this last election, people would say, well, you shouldn't even be allowed to live here. You haven't gotten rec park, one more rec park built yet. Um, but you're, you're focusing on rebuilding a rec center just down the street. And so those are the tough decisions that we have to make as elected officials. We unfortunately don't get to be, um, uh, well, some politicians are populists, but I don't take that position for myself. Uh, I take a pragmatic approach to understand that everybody has their time and we will work through the city on different issues. But again, uh, coming from a methodical perspective and, and knowing that we have to think of the city as an ecosystem is really how the best tax dollar is spent. Um, it doesn't make sense to build redundant rec centers through every area of town knowing that users are very diverse in, in what they they want in terms of service. So it's a challenge in balancing taxes with service. There's never enough money and there's always more demand. Um, and we just have to do that in a, in a sound way and hopefully have a rationale to explain that to folks. Is it easy to make the tough decisions? Never. Probably the hardest part is that you lose friends over them, to be honest. Really? How do you, yeah, like, you know, how, why, why stand for reelection if you could lose friends over ish? Like, like, do you enjoy it that much? And I'm not, this is a complete, like going down the yellow brick road here, because this is a fascinating conversation right now, but you stood for reelection and you're still here and you're still saying, yes, it's not easy to make the tough decisions, but you have to. You have to, and at the end of the day, the community is what is in my heart, and um, I'll always defend that, that I make the decisions on the evidence that I have today and, and make those best decisions. Um, and you do lose friends. I'll use the example of building supportive housing in Kelowna, um, and there was huge opposition to some supportive housing in the past four years, and I just have people that won't talk to me anymore because I voted in favor of it, but at the end of the day, I know that there's 50 people living in that supportive housing unit now that were previously living in a tent. So at the end of the day, that is um, that outweighs the friendship to me and hopefully people come back around. Um, but you only have this small window and not a lot of people get to do this job. So unfortunately, I think populism is eroding leadership right now, um, not locally, not just locally or provincially or nationally, but across North America. And it takes courage and it takes bravery to make those tough calls. And that's part of the thing we're bat battling this term is the difference between making courageous decisions and having the public guide uh, guide your decision, which is an important aspect, but it can't be the sole purpose because we're gifted with a lot of information in these roles that we have to consider when we're making those decisions. I feel like we could just talk an hour on populism and Ken, uh, counselor, but we, I want to turn to our last segment because I am cautious of time here and you are a busy man. And the last segment is my favorite. Well, not that this hasn't been an enlightening conversation already, but uh, it's a favorite conversation for myself and my husband because he is the former minister of tourism and he has ingrained tourism into my head in the province of Alberta. And we are hitting the road this summer and we are coming to Kelowna. So as tourists, as anyone who's listening to this, because we have listeners from across Canada and around the world, if they're coming to the city of Kelowna tomorrow, what are the hidden gems that they should be stopping in and seeing? Oh, man, there are so many. And it's just grown astronomically since I moved here in 1993. Obviously, <clears throat> we're known for our outdoors from um, the ski hills in the winters to the golf course, which I can't personally stand golf, but people love golfing. So we've got great golf courses um, to the wineries, um, to outdoor concerts at the wineries. 
Um, the Kelowna Pride Festival has really taken off as well. Um, as a young gay boy here in Kelowna, we used to have dances every other month. It's now grown to uh, tens of thousands of people in June. So we got a lot of people traveling in for that. Um, and then there's just tons of beautiful regional park spaces to be able to go out and explore. So I think that's what attracted a lot of people here with the COVID effect is that we've got a lot of outdoor activities and nothing and COVID showed us that uh, we need to have outdoor space to um, to flourish. So th those would probably be my favorites. Um, and of course, we have the beautiful and pristine lake. So but what about yourself, though, after a stressful day at council, after a stressful day at work? Where do you go to decompress in the city? And I'm going to say this because every councillor and mayor I've spoken to has all said the exact same thing. You cannot say your house. Where in the community do you go to decompress? <laughs> well, uh, or, my house is definitely or in the, the central uh, region, the regional district of the central Okanagan. Where do you go to decompress in either that or the city? Yeah. I love that question. So I would probably say that um, our regional parks are really spanning and quite huge. So um, Ian and I love to just grab some food after a long day and, and drive up into one of the parks and, and enjoy nature. Um, but you'll also generally see me at some of our local uh, microbreweries and um, and uh, lounges. I do love being around people. So I, I love ending the ending the week there. Actually, I'm heading to um, one of those cocktail bars right after this interview. So uh, um, you'll generally find me out on out on the town, usually downtown um, or at home. So, so my last question for you here, counselor, and this is it take as long as you want to answer this. For you, what makes the city of Kelowna such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Oh, I think you just answered the question yourself uh, because it is so diverse in terms of what you can find here, whether it's um, outdoor space or it's um, cultural aspects like uh, music. We've got some great art companies, whether it's um, Opera Kelowna or Ballet Kelowna or the symphony um, and just lots of opportunities that don't require money. And so, you know, we've got the expensive things like golf and skiing, of course, um, but you have the ability to go out and enjoy nature and find your own peace of mind. And again, from a leadership perspective, I think that's really important to know as we kind of circle back to the beginning of the conversation around affordability. It's what we invest to into as public infrastructure for people to enjoy that doesn't cost them anything that's really important especially as we head into more uncertain financial times is that we're making decisions that are going to support people so they can enjoy their life and why they live here in the Okanagan. We all have to work, but we also have to have those aspects that build community and bring us closer together. And that's done through how we invest socially. Um, Councillor, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down for the last 45 minutes, almost 50 minutes now, and talking about yourself, your community, the region, and some tourism. It's always a pleasure to sit down and talk to local elected leaders from across Canada. Um, the city of Kelowna is lucky to have you at the council table. The region is lucky to have you as its chair. I wish you all the best, and I'm looking forward to potentially meeting you when my husband and I come through uh, Kelowna later. Later on this summer, we may come through June because let's be honest, Calgary is one of these cities that has their pride in September for some reason. So we're, we have nothing to do in June. So we'll come in June to Kelowna's pride. Perfect. And it's been an honor. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We are back Monday with, uh, we're heading to Ontario to speak to the mayor of Innisfil, Ontario. So tune in for that. Till then, keep talking, everyone.